I'm not convinced the state's there for our, um, our, our well-being. Yeah. Um, certainly because they don't share the same values. As right. Me. But of control, um, the last largest episode that we had was 9-11. And the constitutional rights that were so easily revoked. I'm not convinced the state's there for these various things. The way airports are now. Um, that was never rolled back. And so uh, there's concerns that um, it's not like when the state gets an opportunity to seize power and surveillance, um, control things, medically monitor, review, um, that out of a time of crisis, when people so reluctantly, reluctantly uh, not only uh, give up, or should I say easily give up their rights and because of fear, it's not like the state after they get out of crisis goes, okay, let's return back to normal. Um, so, we could expect that it's going to continue yeah. like this. We don't despair, though. Again, um, the city of God right, versus the city of man. The city of man will not triumph right. over uh, the city of God. And the Bill Gates of hell will not triumph <laughs> over oh, the church. All right, thank you, Father. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bless you, brother. Time no see. 
How are you guys doing? Well, I have something for you. Welcome, y'all. Let's see how many people we have. 24 watching right now. So I wanted to, you know, a lot of you know that I, I've written some papers on the theory of technocracy. And I've returned, I'm starting to write some more about uh, technocracy and doing some stuff in my political philosophy class that's made me return back to this, some of these themes and writing some new articles. And therefore, one of the articles that I came to revisit and read for the second or third time is John Gunnell. And John Gunnell's article entitled The Technocratic Image in the Theory of Technocracy. And it's really good as far as giving uh, an excellent kind of survey of technocracy. So I thought I'd actually read through and um, discuss this with you for tonight's adventure, especially because, again, as Christians, we're facing a, a crisis um, with the coof. And in order to, you know, we get in a lot of debates about what science is and being safe and, and these various things. And as I've argued before, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Science is historically situated in certain socio-political uh, dominant structures. And, and so to properly understand if something actually is good science and when good science is actually being done, you have to make an analysis in terms of the dominating kind of structure and ideology, uh, the kind of historical socio-political structure. And what we live in today is technocracy and so a lot of the themes that I brought up as far as like what scientism is when science fails these kind of Gnostic systems a lot of which I pulled from Eric Vogelin's science politics and Gnosticism and combining this again with my uh, area of expertise of philosophy of science and epistemology you know, it's not simply, this is a message for all the, the normie docs and the cucka docs out there that you don't just trust the system. It isn't just science. Things aren't, you know, simply as they appear. These aren't conspiracy theories. These are actually academic theories uh, in, in politics and epistemology and philosophy of science. And to know whether you can trust this, and if you are trusting this system that we can just believe whatever they say, what's going on, um, you're naive. I hate to say it, you're naive, and you have to realize that this system is not trustworthy. That the science that's being done is situated in a theory called technocracy, which is the dominating elite structure in which all of this is operating in. And if you're not read and you're not learned in these areas, then again, you're a normie. Things are as, you know, just as they seem. Um, and that's dangerous when there's a threat like this, um, especially with people's lives and livelihoods, for you to play normadox and cuckadox is a dangerous thing. So I'm hoping, you know, with the grace of God, just reading through some of these academic articles and educating people that they'd be informed to be able to make wise decisions and really kind of see what's going on. So without further ado, let me just give a brief introduction of who Dr. John Gunnell is. Dr. John Gunnell is a professor of political science in the Graduate School of Public Affairs at State University in New York. Now, he's also been the author of many books and articles on the history of political philosophy and the methodological um, issues dealing with so the social sciences. The article that we're going to go over today 
is actually published um, from John Hopkins University Press in Technology and Culture. Again, publisher, John Hopkins University Press, and the Society for the History of Technology. So these are academic sources that I'm going to be using. And without further ado, let's just see how, how you're doing in the chat. 36, wonderful. God bless you guys. Remember, I'll post here, because YouTube's disabled my super chats, you can send to Streamlabs right there. I put it in the chat box there. And I'll take up your questions at the end. All right. Let's see if we have... Let's begin, shall we? So in recent years, there's been a growing concern about technocracy as a problem, both in modern industrial societies, also in developing third world countries. However, students have confronted a difficulty in studying technocracy. The analysis of the phenomenon, the definition of the problem, and the prescription of remedies have been both informed and constrained by variations of an image that has long history in Western thought. There has been not so much a short of empirical information as an absence, John Gunnell argues here, of an adequate conceptual connections between the technocratic image and political facts. He states, in general, technocracy has been taken to mean the government or control of society by scientists, technicians, or engineers, or at least the exercise of political authority by virtue of technical competence and expertise in the application of knowledge. But the technocratic image has been Janice-faced. Technocracy has often been associated with a utopian social vision. And one of the things that in my political philosophy class, we had finished um, Dante Germino's Machiavelli to Marx, in which we were going over 18th and 19th uh, century political philosophers. A lot of them will become relevant today when we're talking about St. Simona Comp scientism. Um, but, you know, even the other political philosophers as well, there is that common theme of the utopian social vision, amortizing the eschaton, making the kingdom of heaven here now without God, a kingdom in man's image, a kingdom of man. It really is an anti-kingdom. So technocracy, John Gunnell goes on to say, has been so often associated with that kind of utopian social vision. Yet it's also been regarded as a political pathology. Since World War II, there's been an increasing tendency to approach the analysis of technocracy from the latter perspective. And it is this view of it as a problem which is the principal concern of his essay. The first section briefly traces the general contours of the technocratic image. The second section offers a typology of the critical analysis of recent theories of technocracy. And third, examines the classic political idea that seems at least tacitly to inform most critiques of technocracy. The final section of his article presents two distinct but related theses. First, the philosophy that underlay the founding of the American Republic embodied the belief that it was possible to create through political artifice an institutional surrogate for the classic ideal. The founding fathers expressed a faith in the possibilities of a political technology and the complementarat, complementarat, oh my gosh, complementary um, aspect of technology in popular government, which has remained a persistent feature of American social thought and social sciences. So remember what I was saying that if we're going to understand the science, especially with the virus and stuff like that, you have to situate, that stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum. 
um, you can't actually just trust the experts. Okay, you have to be able to do this kind of critical analysis. And part of that's going to involve, obviously, um, even looking back to the philosoph uh, philosophy that underlay the founding of the American, our American Republic, which John Gunnell goes to say, second, although the model of pluralist constitutionalist politics reflected in the American system has often been viewed as a solution to or safeguard against technocratic tendencies, the actual operation of the system may be conducive to the emergence of the very problems associated with technocracy. There I agree. And as I go through his article, I'll, you know, I'll be critical myself too, where I think that he's on to something here. Um, he's not seen something in another part and so on. Anyways, he goes on to say that if so, this situation cannot be explained by traditional theories of technocracy. So he himself was presenting um, kind of a unique approach to this that hadn't been done before in a kind of general analysis of what he calls the traditional theories of technocracy. So let's go into the history just kind of generally without getting into the critical analysis yet of what technocracy actually is, where it originated from. It originated, the term technocracy, in the United States in 1919 by an engineer named William Smith. It first became common when it was adopted by a movement that developed later in the 19, um, or the early 30s as a response to the Great Depression. That movement, which for a time gained considerable notoriety and a substantial following, began with a group of technicians and engineers dedicated to social reform and a substantial following. And that began with a group of technicians and engineers dedicated to social reform, whose concepts were modeled on the technological republic of Edward Bellamy's late 19th century utopian novel, Looking Backward. They're also influenced by the economic theories of Thorstein Velbum, and the principles of the scientific management growing out of the work of Frederick W. Taylor, both of which actually suggested that much like the latter work of James Burnham in the managerial society, that politicians and industrial entrepreneurs should and would give way to technical elites. Although the movement may have appeared somewhat bizarre, it reflected a characteristic American faith in the compatibility of technology and civil vitality. The aim was to abolish corrupt politics and an obsolete economic system and expand administrative and technical rationality. Technocracy has been applied retrospectively to many of the technological utopias or dystopias that are so persistent, so persistent of a feature of Western literature and political theory. From the beginning, there's been a fundamental tension between the concepts of homo faber and homo politicus, right? The technical man versus the political man. The Greeks believed that social life began with the Promethean gift of techne. I've talked about what that Greek word actually means, the tool of the artisan, um, which is kind of where you get, you know, homo faber, right? The, the technician, the artisan, right? The man of art, of technique. But the legacy of that gift was ambiguous. According to Plato, it was the origin of politics in the sense that human beings were able to undertake their own governance. Yet it has been often suggested that Plato's notion of the application of political knowledge through the demiurgic art of philosophical ruler, or true statesman, if you remember Plato's Republic, that would eliminate politics as a distinct and autonomous mode of human activity. Plato and Aristotle both emphasized the primacy of political rule for determining the scope and application of all other arts and forms of knowledge within the polis. 
But Aristotle stressed the idea of the polis as a political association or public community of citizens deliberating about and managing the affairs of the city. The idea of transforming the human condition by technological means, so foreign to Greeks, may have actually appeared first in Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun, 1602, with its emphasis on technical education and the creation of leisure through the use of machines. But that book, usually taken to be the paradigm of scientific utopia, is actually Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which is 1627. And I've talked about Sir Francis Bacon's book, New Atlantis. Bacon's vision was not free of ambiguity, like so many of these novel great ideas, right? Proudhon, Fish, the philosophes, um, they leave you with um, a lack of details and abundance of ambiguity regarding the relationship between power and knowledge or between the state and science. He, being Bacon, conceived of a new social order dedicated to the expansion of modern science and progress in human achievement through the dominion over nature. Now, remember, I've talked about that, that that's one of the, as Eric Vogelin highlights, one of the defining themes of the modern Gnostic is a rejection of the actual world, because it's bad, right? Poorly constructed, right? A destruction of that with the grounds of that order, i.e. God, and the replacement of that by his own kind of construction, which inevitably leads to a kind of libido dominante, a dominion over nature, as Bacon points out here. But did not entirely, he, he, Bacon did not entirely clarify how these goals were to fit with political purpose and rule over uh, civil society. By the 18th century, the French philosophes that I just mentioned we're predicting inevitable progress in human knowledge and its rational application of control and, and perfection of human affairs. Yet the Enlightenment ideal was not without critics. In fact, Rousseau, for example, questioned the implications of progress in the arts and sciences, not only for human happiness, but also for the integrity and authority of political community. Many of the characteristic features in the technocratic image may be found in the work of Henry de Saint-Simon, 1760 to 1825. Remember I mentioned him. And then also um, with him, his vision of the industrial society where an elite class of engineers, scientists, industrialists, and planners systematically apply their technical knowledge to a solution of social problems and the creation of a rational social order. Again, another theme that begins with the 18th, I mean, it's an enlightenment theme, right? The rational social order, this rational um, law, universal kind of law becomes religious in nature and replaces kind of God's law and natural law. But it's ambiguous what that actually means. It's just constantly appealed to. But if Bacon's New Atlantis was the first example of a scientific utopia, Saint Simon provided the first model of pure technocracy. For Saint Simon, governance of society was to be an administration of things that would take from each according to capacity and provide for each according to performance. Political institutions would be replaced by a parliament of technical experts. A similar concept was advanced by St. Simone's follower, um, Auguste Comte, 1798, 
1857. He believed in an imminent historical progression toward a positivist era. So this is where positivism actually comes in. Wherein scientific method would be extended to control of society and classic political regimes would be superseded, his social authority was vested in a class of administrators drawn from the pure and applied sciences. Isn't this that wonderful? Much of Western sociology has incorporated the idea that a society developed its moves inevitably, for better or worse, in the direction of instrumental rationality. The classic expression of this thesis can be found in the work of Max Weber, 1864-1930 was Weber, whose theory of bureaucracy has proved an enduring model for analysis of technocratic phenomenon. For Weber, or Weber, modernity involved a steady advance in the direction of a rational legal administration with emphasis on procedural rules and Zev <laughs> if I can pronounce this, Zvekrationalatit. Okay, if uh, any Germans out there, forgive me for my butchering the pronunciation. Bureaucracy was the most efficient and advanced form of administration, but also tended to transform itself into an autonomous form of policy making, which encroached on the functions of the politician. Weber believed that bureaucracy was not well suited to perform this function and that while professing ideological neutrality, it often reflected the conservative views of the upper classes from what the, the bureaucrats were usually recruited. According to Weber, while the politician was forced to win support in competitive public forum, the bureaucrat was accountable only in terms of standards of skill and efficiency. The problem in modern society was to restrict the bureaucrat to his proper role and prevent the subversion of democratic political will. Bureaucracy for Weber did not merely represent governmental or government administration, but the rationalizing tendency in all associations characteristic of modern life including law and economics. His concept of the march of technical rationale in the world, the rise of a bureaucratic elite, and the relationship between bureaucracy and ideology exemplified all the principal elements of the technocratic image. And by the way, this kind of notion of a progress to this kind of utopia, um, this historicism is obviously in Hegel and Karl Marx as well, to name some uh, Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment thinkers, political thinkers. So I'm just trying to, you know, kind of connect the dots and show these kind of common themes. How did we get where we got to today? Well, that's the authors and uh, political thinkers that I'm referencing will give the, provide that answer. So Weber's concept, we just outlined there, but it was Karl Mannheim, as opposed to Weber, was an optimist by the 1930s about the possibility of social control and planning through an applied science of politics that would transcend ideology and utopia. So by the way, you'll get this theme too, that the science and the new science, the scientific age, um, again, it's, it's, it's paradoxically utopian, but it will transform and transcend all politics and ideologies. Um, it makes me think of John Lennon's song, Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you can. No hell below us, only the brotherhood of man. Um, there's no possessions, right? Blah, blah. I, <laughs> it's exactly the same kind of, you know, theme here. I mean, obviously, you kind of get this in Marx's um, fulfillment of history at the end, uh, pure communism and stuff like that, in which the all politics is dissolved um, and you have a uh, what does he call it? Uh, 
dictatorial proletariat class um, and one's no longer alienated from their labor and stuff like that. But you get these kind of themes again of an abolition and transcending, transforming of all politics, uh, transcending all ideologies, all properties, possessions, etc. In this case, it's going to be science that's going to save us of that. While Mannheim maintained that all of knowledge and political values reflected particular social and cultural interests and perspectives, he also believed that the 20th century society promised or had already produced a form of social knowledge that was not tied to particular concerns. He further claimed that an intellectual and political synthesis, a fusion of knowledge and power, could be achieved through the instrumentality of an increasingly classless intelligentsia here again these kind of marxist themes right specialized knowledge could be applied to democratic social planning in an age in which those aspects of life amenable to rationalization were growing and politics was giving way to administration such ideas were subsequently reflected in the diverse arguments that came to be associated with the end of ideology doesn't that sound like a presidential campaign vote for me end of ideology <laughs> my campaign so there was actually something called the end of ideology thesis during the 1950s so i'm not you know i'm making a joke but i'm not too far off here common to these arguments was the belief that modern industrial society by its potential to solve fundamental social problems had eliminated the conditions that gave rise to extreme ideologies of right and left, and even made interest politics itself obsolete. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? What a miracle. Praise be science. What was required was the application of administrative, intellectual, and mechanical technology to pragmatic resolution of particular social issues. So isn't this great, guys? Finally, science is going to, what? It's going to absolve the need for capital, for currency, um, eliminate poverty, eliminate classes. It will end racism. It'll save the planet. You, you see where I'm getting here? These events of the late 1960s obviously tended to undermine this thesis right history always kind of does that people always kind of refute these things right in their behavior and shut down these kind of optimistic utopian ideas and yet the notion persists that there is or should be a decline of politics and ideology in the knowledgeable society the technocratic society is Late as 1978, the historian Daniel Borston celebrated the American experimental spirit and maintained that, quote, the technology dilutes and dissolves ideology as well as inevitably triumphing over tribalism, nationalism, and the crusading spirit in religion, bigotry, censorship, racism, persecution, immigration, emigration restrictions, tariffs, and chauvinism. Sound familiar? The technocratic image then has been ambivalent. For every looking backward in the book, there has been a Caesar's column to warn of the dangers of the technological world. The social destruction produced by technology in Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee is given a counterpoint in the vision of the technological community represented in Howe's travelers from all Taria. B.F. Skinner's Walden 2, Walden Part 2, is suggestive of continuing faith in social technology, but the trend has been toward the dark visions of Carl Capek, Eugene Zamatin, George Orwell, and Kurt Vonnegut. 
where technology leads not only to social domination, but the dehumanization. That is a thesis that I've actually argued for in my papers and presentations throughout the various conferences where I presented. Bacon's Island gives way to the islands of Aldous Huxley and Austin Wright, where the quality of life depends on the control, if not elimination, of technological extensions of human beings. Whether viewed pessimistically or optimistically, Gunnell states, there is little dissent from the assumption that politics is increasingly subject to the influence of technological change. Yes, I agree, John Gunnell. Especially given the crisis now, we can see exactly how that's playing out. And for the most part, the technocratic image is now associated with a political pathology. Yes, amen, that is true. Okay, his second part, his second section of the article goes kind of into that exact relation. The precise nature of the impact of technology on politics is sometimes ambiguous, he states, but it seems to involve three distinct, though not mutually exclusive theories, dimensions, or levels of analysis. And he states that one, in circumstances in which political decisions necessarily involve specialized knowledge and the exercise of technical skills, political power tends to gravitate towards technological elites. Gil Bates and Dr. Fauci. Give me some technocracy. So we can agree with one. How about two? Technocracy has become autonomous. Hence, politics has become a function of systemic structural determinants over which politics has little or no control. Why? Because technology has become autonomous. Uh, I agree with that. Yes. Three, technology and science constitute a new legitimating ideology that subtly masks forms of social domination. Absolutely. Look at what's going on with the COOF, right? Again, this is why it's so important too, that it's so naive and, and dumb, I'm sorry, to be like, oh, we've got to wear our, you know, our diapers and we've got to listen to it because, uh, you know, we don't want people to get sick and we don't want to be, you know, we want to care and stuff like that. Um, obviously, I wouldn't want to offend and do stuff and I want to care for people and I'm for science and I'm for, you know, health and stuff like this. But what happens when you find out that this whole thing has been constructed around a real virus in order, right, it's been planned in order to, exactly as it says, consummate a new legitimating ideology that's going to subtly mask, it's going to basically be for social domination, right? If this is created and the data and the science isn't even good data and, and trustworthy, right? Because as I'd argued before, that this is a modern Gnostic system and so they conceal within wordplay using the terms always to give it authority and legitimize it science or philosophy, reason, um, these different things, when in fact it's not actually in many of these cases such, then it isn't simply about, you know, just being nice to our neighbors and following along. These people can't be trusted, right? Um, and I would argue this is, this is an anti-kingdom. Um, and we shouldn't be trusting and aligning ourselves with this. And I've given some prescriptions about how we as Christians and Orthodox should actually, Orthodox Christians proceed to actually create an environment where good science can be done. It's as difficult as that might be. But first thing is to recognize there's actually a problem, right? Isn't that what they tell like alcoholics and drug addicts? The first step, you, <laughs> you have a problem, right? I'm speaking to you guys out there 
Um, first thing, you got to admit there are a problem. Quit being so normadox or cuckadox, right? Um, wake up. Or join the B system. In each level of analysis, there's concern about the depreciation of the political realm, the subversion of traditional basis of authority, and the ascenders ascendancy of instrumental over political rationality. More specific concern usually centers on, on the problem of circumvention or atrophy of democratic or representative political institutions. The elite theory of technocracy has been the dominant one, especially since President Eisenhower issued his warning about the rise of, the, and I find this interesting, quote, military industrial complex and the danger that public policy could itself become the captive of scientific technological elite. Gil Bates and Dr. Fauci, give me some brainwashing. There has been a proliferation of literature attempting either to document or disprove the presence of such danger. Well, yeah, <laughs> fact checkers. What's not happening? That's, that's a conspiracy theory. You just were fact-checked. Certain <laughs> concomitants of governmental support of scientific research and technological developments in the United States and governmental dependence on science and industry, particularly in the area of defense, certainly suggest a danger of this sort. So look, Gunnell's trying to, like, be fair. Like that. Look, there's these people who are saying, you know, attempt to disprove this, but certainly... There is quite a bit of evidence, um, and we can argue that there is a uh, presence of such danger. In developing countries where so much of modernization depends on the transfer and application of advanced technology, the appearance of similar danger might seem likely. Here's a good author to keep note of this, C.P. Snow. And C.P. Snow, who dramatically pursued the problem of influence of experts on political decisions, argued that, quote, here's C.P. Snow's quote, one of the most bizarre features of any advanced industrial society in our time is that the cardinal choices have to be made by a handful of men in a world of closed politics and secret scientific choices, where there is no appeal to a larger assembly in the sense of group of opinion or electorate. Now, again, this is part of this transparency too. Um, whom do you put your trust, right? Are we just supposed to trust this, this group, the scientists, the experts, or the managerial technical elite who share none of our values? In fact, they're just the opposite, right? their antichrist values. But all you cuckadocs out there want to enormous docs put your faith in them more than even the monastics is very telling. Um, God help you. Outside of fiction, uh, Gunnell states that this has seldom been suggested that there is an actual conspiracy by scientific power elite or danger of political takeover by scientists. Um, I beg to disagree. Again, if we come to some of the actual, for example, um, the elites themselves, uh, the technocrats, let me just give you a couple. Arthur Kessler, Ghost of the Machine, Brzezinski, Between Two Ages, uh, a recent one, Klaus Schwab's, right, the, um, what the heck was the name of his new thing that came out? Kufid 19, The Great Reset. Um, here's two interesting ones for us, too. Bertrand Russell's The Scientific Outlook and Bertrand Russell's The Impact on Society. Um, I can give you more kind of reference where there actually is an actual conspiracy. Also, let me see. I'm going to actually see if I can share screen with you on this. Because I think this is the 
smoking gun on oh Jonas Salk's uh, survival of the wisest here it is from John Hopkins University can you hear the children outside The world could be going to hell, but like it's amazing that like just the wonderful voices of children playing outside um, makes things all worthwhile. Remember, Christ says you must become like little children. The narrative. So the image of God is still with us, brothers and sisters. Okay, where did I just put this? <laughs> Here it is. Ba 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 ba. Now I just have to share a screen. So this is this uh, published by John Hopkins University Center for Health Security. I'm going to pull the year. It's 2017, but just so I can prove to you. October 2017. Go read this. It's called The Spars Pandemic, uh, kind of a futuristic scenario for public health risk communications. There was like, they just gave like a projected date, like imagine, imagine a virus, a Spars virus in 2528. How would government Um, media, Hollywood, and all the stuff deal with it. Talks about the stabbies, mRNAs, the side effects, what's going to happen with all. And as you, it even goes through, <clears throat> um, look at Vax, uh, stabby injuries. Okay. It, also, it even goes, lovers and haters, it goes through basically how to create a propaganda machine using Hollywood, rappers, um, fact checkers are even put in here, um, how to create scapegoats, and you read it, it'll even give like tweets, and it's verbatim actually what's going on. Um, this is the smoking gun that actually this whole thing has been planned at least as far back as 2017. And another great illustration of how technocracy would work as far as social domination over um, and pro you know forms of propaganda and stuff like that. Conspiracy theory, Normadox, so again, that was just to illustrate, no, actually, and I, I can't remember when the John Gunnell article is written to you, but I've given you some things around there was actually, I just cited um, some of the best authors, most respected authors in their field to give uh, a rebuttal against uh, John Gunnell's claim that outside of fiction has seldom been suggested there's an actual conspiracy by scientific power elite. Wrong. Or danger of political takeover by scientists. Wrong. It's it's here. That's there's the evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a smoking gun. Nevertheless, many of Ralph's labs believe that scientists in the key advisory positions wield enormous power and that rendering of decisions by a few technically skilled individuals not subject to public scrutiny could produce a situation which the ordinary checks and balances of democracy might fail. As early as 1949, George Gervich spoke of the dangers of technobiocracy. And this theme has been thoroughly pursued by Jean Maynard's in his attempt to analyze the spread into political life of the complex demands of the workings of technological civilization. And you're just going to start to notice how this played out in the elections too, stuff about fraud, how this all works to set up and is playing in the hands of technocracy. You're naive and dumb if you think that politics is normal, right? 
It's you're uneducated. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. But it's okay. We can all learn, right? It's okay to be ignorant as long as you're not, op, you know, obstinate in your ignorance, <laughs> right? I refuse to believe. No, no, no. Then we've got a problem. So, again, that's why I'm just sharing with you this scholarly information and reasoned, principled arguments. The question that Maynard raises is whether the technocratic attitude is undermining representative constitutional government and, and precipitating the gradual eroding of real power away from the normal machinery of politics. I mean, after what's happened, I don't know how anybody can trust in politics, unless you're really normie. How anybody could trust in politics and voting anymore. He argues that technocracy has dethroned the politician. Or at least that the technocrats has acquired a decisive influence. While Maynard sees government by technocrats as still a long way off, he regards the process of transfer as somewhat something that is underway. And this was written all the way back, 1949. His solution to make the technical function answerable for its actions to a democratic power and to ensure that it's placed under the supervision of a higher authority consisting of elected representatives. Well, what happens, guys, when the elected representatives are not elected, but elected for you by the technocrats, or it's played out that way? What the system has taken over, right? From So that would be one question. I was like, well, how do you prevent them from actually corrupting the electorate process? The, the way this is to be affected and seen, however, is not clear. Oh, surprise, surprise. Great, grand ideas, vague ideas from all these philosophers. Well, how do we do it? Well, nobody knows. <laughs> it's not clear as the general prescription. In the United States, there has been a persistent faith in the intrinsic mechanisms of constitutionalist pluralistic politics. Yeah, it's a crazy religion, right? This persistent faith. Um, I call it American acceptable. <laughs> That wouldn't happen to us. Um, we have faith in the pluralism and constitutionalism of our republic. And probably the most influential analysis of the issue of these days has been Don Price's The Scientific State. Price sees science and technology as creating a new dimension of politics, one that poses distinct questions about the status of representative government. It often seems as if political institutions are too cumbersome to deal with the problems arising from the growth of scientific knowledge and the proliferation of technology. The effect has been to transform our constitutional order by, quote, here's this quote, moving the public and private sectors closer together. And the technological and scientific enterprises, as well as business and industry, have become tied to national policymaking. Price additionally suggests that the scientific revolution is upsetting our system of checks and balances in that it has weakened the more the moral authority of religious institutions by critical skepticism. Yes, that's happened. That's an excellent point. Quote, and made the universities themselves depend on the government. <laughs> by the way, this is actually where all this propaganda comes from, right? So any checks and actual checks and balances, you actually have to dissolve and let people know it's dissolved, right, by a critical skepticism, right, as he says, or give the illusion that these systems are still operating. Um, but the propaganda comes mostly through, right, the university in the media and the corporations. So notice what we're going through right now. All the corporations, all of Hollywood, all the stuff going on in the universities, they're all speaking with one voice. One of us. One of one. No dissent, right? It's shut down. Um, why that doesn't cause people pause for concern, right? I have no idea. What's the saying? Thou dost protest too much. I mean, if you were a detective and you found that everybody was giving the exact same story. And that anybody that tried to give a different story, well, 
they just ended up missing, right? Or they couldn't talk anymore or something like that. That wouldn't be a surprise to you. Why hasn't anybody thought about this? Most significantly, there has come to an existence a scientific state which challenges the old notion that matters of public policy, the scientists must be controlled by the purposes defined by politicians. Because you're still under this naive idea that the state, that politics is, is, is normal, um, and that the state actually controls things. And ignore the whole kind of theories of the technocrats and technocracy itself, the rise of it. Yet yeah, Price believes that this threat of corporate society is being deflected by American pluralism and the structure of a constitutional system. So he's, optim he's unfortunately naively optimistic and is going to go into actually, it's our pluralism and the very found founding of our country that's actually creates or at least puts fire, um, gas on the fire. While the persistent American faith in the unity of science and democracy must be evaluated, it's not been misplaced. American society is already meeting the challenge by developing a new equilibrium with comp which complements the systems of checks and balances in the formal constitution. Even though it's not really possible in modern society to preserve the idea of the electorate or its representatives, you should make policy decisions by public decisions of the key issues, including their scientific aspects. There is a system at work which connects power and knowledge of politics and science. Professions such as engineering, medicine, and law act as a bridge between scientific knowledge and political action by, aiding, by adding a social purpose to pure science. Gaps in professional expertise are filled in by the administrators of concrete organizations. Finally, on the spectrum of from truth to power, there is the politician who makes decisions on the basis of value judgments and interests which do not admit of technical rationality. Price maintains that these four functions, scientific, professional, administrative, political, find institutional expression in the states which form an ordered system of authority and responsibility, in short, a constitutional system. So this is what he's believing. So he's just giving, Gunnell's giving the other side of the argument that like, Somebody who, like Price, who acknowledges like a potential threat of technocracy and what that is, but he thinks somehow naively that, as outlined here, um, Americanism and its pluralism and constitutionalism are going to save the day in the end. Okay, that does not supplement, supplant the normal political process, but works within it, he believes and compensates for deficiencies created when the old pluralism becomes obsolete. Moreover, it's not simply the structural features of a system which make it viable what people think and believe. Hence, Price argues that the system is ultimately sustained by consensus that science and politics and a free system while freely interacting through the professions and mission have to be maintained as mutually independent states each able to check and criticize each other. Um, well, that ain't going to happen, and it isn't happening. So he's putting faith, as Gunnar puts in, the kind of mechanism of a pluralistic society. It's, he also says that same idea, that kind of naive, optimistic idea, is reflected in Daniel Bell's characterization of post-industrialism. Um, for Bell, decisions are a matter of power. He does believe that. The crucial questions in any society are who holds the... And this is good of Bell to actually acknowledge this. Who holds the power and how is the power held? Excellent questions. In modern industrial size, technical skills, the basis, the access of power. It's the Gil Bates, the Fauci's, the Klaus Schwab's in the European um, form. What is it? Schwab up here. Mr. Mallorit, the World Economic Forum, right? These are the people that hold power. But there's again a convergence. What we'll just see is technocracy, not only technical elites, but bankers, right, that fund um, as well to maintain a kind of managerial society of elite. 
that will then have politics be determined by because technology is now uh, autonomous from politics. How are you guys doing so far? 43 watching, sweet. Good to see you guys. Don't forget, here is Super Chats can be made in. Let me see if anybody's added. Um, let me just give a shout out. Mick Ale, donate 10 bucks. Thank you. May God continue to bless you. Thank you for the good works you do. I'll try to keep that up. Um, Wolf Steaks, donated $10. Thank you, Father Deacon, for your great talk. Well, thank you. White Top donated five bucks. Thank you. Allows me to continue to do my work. Helps motivate me and to write more and do more for you. So um, I really appreciate that and your support. Shall we return? Previously in episode one, the technocrats were threatening to take Father Deacon to an underground lair. Okay. <laughs> Get my paper up. So again, yeah, good questions. Who holds the power? How is the power held? The scientific elite. Okay, let's go on. John Kenneth Galbraith's image of modern industrial society and the rise of techniques is not significantly different from Bell's image or prices, although Galbraith does not see an elite of scientists and technicians assuming power. He does believe in the new industrial states of the West control had shift to what he terms the techno structure. So we're just going over various people's theories on and then we'll provide kind of a critique. This is the the techno structure. This is the association of men of diverse techn technical knowledge, experience, or other talent which modern industrial technology and planning require. Gal Galbraith argues that in this kind of social system, power no longer resides in individuals, either managers or entrepreneurs, but in organizations. Uh, that's a great point. So the World Economic Forum, um, the Rockefeller Institute, uh, help me out, guys. What are some other? Maybe give me, like, say, John Hopkins University. Uh, so I think he's correct on that. It's not necessarily the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? Is these kind of large foundations would be what we would call organizations in modern industry. Decisions draw upon information based by various people with specialized scientific and technological knowledge. And obviously those be organized within these foundations and organizations. Technological imperatives and the need for planning coordination in the complex society demand that decisions be the product of groups. Thus the power passes to organizations. Yes, I agree with that. I think that he's on correct on that. That's the techno structure. And that techno structure as Galbraith speaks of embraces all. How oh, nice. Coexist, guys. Let's just all embrace all, only those who bring specialized knowledge, talent, or experience to group decision making. Um, essential workers only. <laughs> Sorry, the rest of you plebs are out, right? Um, think about Jonas Salk's book, Survival of the Wisest. Are you starting to make these kind of connections? Political consequences of the emergence of the technostructure is the industrial systems ex inextricably linked and associated with the state. It has to be. Okay. There is no clear line between the public and private. That's true. The power and goals of the industrial system and the state are mutually interdependent. And this technostructure of the large corporation tends to become an extension of those parts of the federal bureaucracy on which it most depends. Galbraith has an answer to the problems posed by the technostructure, but it's not very compelling, Gunnell says, or far-reaching. It's not deep. I find it philosophically boring. <laughs> he recommends a, a systematic questioning of beliefs imposed by the industrial system. <laughs> 
Well, we see where questioning gets you, right? Fact checkers, your Twitter accounts pulled down. Um, perhaps Freeze William be defrocked. Uh, people put in jail. I... <laughs> or, as I argued from Eric Vogelins, you just create an operating system in which the um, those questions aren't even practically possible to raise. And just to put a cherry on top, use the social pressure and shaming and group think through social media and all the media and all the corporations to speak with one voice. You don't want to be the freak, right? You, we're all in this together. Let's save lives. Don't be a grandma murderer. Oh, and don't forget, always add for uh legitimizing reasons the word science on it and as i was joking with my class it's amazing it doesn't matter what you're doing if you add the word science i mean think about when uh the creation of the social sciences which was uh why am i blanking on the the author here that you legitimize the social sciences. I'm not wasting my time uh, grocery shopping. I'm doing grocery science. That's why I was late. And they were like, wow, that's not brainwashing a cult. It is uh, mental engineering. It is uh, <laughs> social physics. It's not propaganda and brainwash, it's social physics, right? It's not beating your wife, it's marital physics, right? It's marital engineering. Um, think about all the horrendous things you could get away with by just throwing the word science on there. So likewise, for extra measure, just add the word science when all else fails. So anyways, he goes on. Now, Gunnell goes on to say, hardly anyone would disagree with J.J. Salmon's assertion of the political role of scientists in modern society has created a new relationship between knowledge and power. And in decision-making process, there are no longer any distinct frontiers between the sphere of the politician and the sphere of the scientist. In some instances, the frontier is so fine that the power of decision, in fact, lies with the scientist on political questions and with the politician or scientific questions. What Salmon refers to as the new theater of techno nature does not exactly seem to be ruled by scientists and technicians, according to him. But it's a situation where the scientific and technical elite uses political power for its ends and political power uses science for its ends. So that's his view is what he's saying. Nor would many disagree with Brzezinski. Remember I quoted the Brzezinski's concept of the tectronic age in society that is one culturally and psychologically shaped by technocracy it's not brainwashing it's what is it social physics it's a uh, psychology shaped by technology while some such as Robert Bogus <laughs> unfortunate name. Um, law offered modular warnings about the appearance of class new, new utopians. Others such as Victor Ferkus deprecate the claims of the futurists who predict, by the way, yeah, that's a good term. They're the futurists, right? Hooray, the future. It's always better in the future, guys. They predict that technology will bring politics to an end. So again, here we go. The new utopians, dear Lord, and lead to an era of mass society ruled by scientific elites and totalitarian state. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> wonderful place for us plebs. Ferkis finds little basis for such projections, though, and insists, perhaps because he's a technocrat, that scientists are merely one power group 
and a pluralistic political order. Or he's naive about Again, he's just being fair. He's going over all the kind of the views on technocracy and whether it has potential dangers, how it could be curbed and stuff like that. So he's not one-sided. It's, it's a fair, again, it's a good academic treatment that we're going through. All sides and all things considered. And far from the strongest, he thinks. He argues that the professional politician is still on top. Again, I would argue that's naive, especially what we've seen today and what's going on. Um, the politician is now theater. Okay, let's move on. Um, I'll skip some, but I'm going to keep you here all night. Okay, the emphasis on elites often tends to obscure other dimensions of the relationship between technology and politics, dimensions represented in the literature of philosophy that emphasize such themes as the planetary domination of technique. Wow, it's like my new band name. Ladies and gentlemen, would you, would you welcome planetary domination of technique. As well as more popular work dealing with uh, future shock and the manner in which the structure of technology molds the consciousness and behavior of society in the contemporary age. This brings us back to the second level analysis, the structural theory, which suggests that although there may be instances of public decision making by technologies, the problem is not the, simply the lack of control over technocrats, but rather an inability to control technology itself. Interesting point. Okay. We shall return to Winner, um, the author Winner, uh, Langdon Winner, and by saying, he says, this is a good example of a case in which a picture, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, presently, but first we must consider the philosopher who provided the most expansive and forceful statement of the structural argument. Jacques Ellul. Ellul contends that like the elite theorists, that the dominance of technique in modern society has tended to subvert democracy and create a new aristocracy. Yeah. Politics has become an illusion. Yes. Did, was I not saying this? For the true choice today with regard to political problems depends on the technicians who have prepared a solution. I mean, especially think about if you have complete control of Dominion machines and all this stuff and the media and like, of course you can make politics an illusion. So the true choice today with regard to political problems depends on the technicians who have prepared a solution and the technicians charged with implementing the decision. The state has become omnipotent, but it's simply an instrument of technicians. Uh, that's a good way to put it, actually. The power displacement toward the executive branch is only a stage in the progressive elimination of political action itself. Wow. The problem has developed so far that no answers are to be found in the constitutionalist rules, good institutions, or socioeconomic changes. Um, that's obviously a, a line for the, for the normies. <laughs> Gunnell's like, hey, normies, constitutionalist rules, good institutions, social economic changes aren't going to do it. There's no longer room for ideological debate. For the political realm has not only shrunk, but has become considered secondary and frustrating. So might this not actually be what we saw in the elections, the last election? Like, there's no more confidence in the, right? And that will actually destroy politics and set forth for a greater rule of technocrats. The elements and ideas of political life, such as citizen participation, right? It, that obviously doesn't seem to exist. And representative governments are now missed. I didn't say it, he did, right there. The problem exists in the context in which political order operates and not in the political order itself. Or a little, the growth of technocracy is merely a symptom of a set of circumstances which, quote, necessarily subordinates political decisions to technical evaluations and where the means define the end. Differences in political form become 
inconsequential as socioeconomic development generated by technological motives enforced by technological means, moving in the direction of a technological continuity reveals itself as the meaning of, the, of contemporary history. What he stresses is that the autonomy of technique and its role as the prime mover, both in economics and politics, la technique, la technique, has taken over not just as la politique, but humanity itself, la technique, determines its own course. For Lul, the only answer to the situation is to depolitize and repolitize. And remember, I brought this up with regards to like Sherrard's solution too. Like, well, how do we even like do science? A whole like, and this just shows you the magnitude of the project ahead of us. A full deconstruction of the system and a reconstituting of an orthodox ethos, like in which you could actually trust, right? And have, that's the only way that I know and how that would happen, God only knows if it ever were. Since the technique has now become fused, so anyways, I brought that up because look at it, Lewis saying basically the same thing, depolitize and then repolitize. It's so corrupted, right, that we need a flood um, and that God it needs to repopulate the earth kind of idea. Since technique has now become fused with the state, it's ne necessary to escape the state and then regain democratic control of the apparatus. First step is to have, quote, he says, citizens organized independently of the state. Good luck. So that private life can re be rehabilitated in order to create tension and conflict that will maintain freedom. Well, that's like a libertarian pipe dream. Lula is really suggesting pluralism in and between government and society. What's required, he believes, is the emergence of social, political, intellectual, and artistic bodies, associations, interest groups, or economic or Christian groups, totally independent of the state, yet capable of opposing it. Well, how is that going to happen? Like, able to reject its pressures as well as its control and even its gifts. Sounds like we need, like, an emperor. <laughs> God-ordained emperor is the only like I doubt that's coming, right? Um, who knows, though? Pray. Whether or not one accepts a little apocalyptic vision as arguments about apotheos uh, of technique, another great phrase, his approach raises the issue of whether the impact of technology on the structure of society has not significantly determined both the options and decisions of politics as well as the, the selection and behavior of the decision makers. Winner, chicken dinner, who has most carefully and fully pursued the theme of autonomous technology Technology sees the significant question not as who governs but what governs. Okay, fair enough. That same question has been raised in some of the most significant works of technology and civilization written the, this century. Works of um, George Junger, Carl Jaspers, Lewis Mumford, Siegfried Gideon, Gideon Elul, and others who are concerned about domination by technological process. Uh, processes in modern civilization. In his discussion of technological politics, winner, winner, chicken dinner, emphasizes that he terms reverse adaption. Interesting. The process whereby technical systems become subverted from the ends originally set for them and in effect deprogram themselves and their environment to suit the special conditions of their operation. The artificial slave gradually subverts the rule of its master. This is a situation that involves the adjustment of human ends to match the character of available means. Winner argues that rather than focus on the problem of technological elites, it's necessary to consider the whole of technology's capacity to transform order and adapt animate and inanimate objects to accord with purely technical structures and processes. The point is that technology and conditions created by technology supplant political action or severely limit its possibilities. At a certain point, the givens of technology define the range of choices and shapes the purpose that can be pursued and the needs and goals that are defined. The imperatives are built into the system and the complexity of the artificial world of technological politics results in a loss of agency and the decline of significant of a significant public realm. Okay, so that's a little 
There's no doubt that technologies once embraced tend to limit and even determine decisions and that this contributes to the politics of expertise. Nevertheless, world historical arguments such as Ellul's with this rarefication and spiritualization of concepts as, such as technique are difficult to demonstrate and to relate to specific events in an explanatory manner. It's important to note that decisions to employ technological instruments are often irreversible and that there are structural conditions that give rise to technocracy. Okay, that's what I've been arguing. But the more extravagant version of the structural theory are more metaphysical than empirical. One thing the structural theory does point up however, is the impact of technology on social consciousness. And this brings us to a third notion of technocracy, at least a third mode of analyzing the problem. Now Gunnell turns to, and this is really interesting, the neo-Marxist critical theorists, and they treat technology itself as a form of ideology and has been most closely linked with the individuals associated with the Frankfurt School, such as Max Horemeyer. Herbert Marcuse, uh, Jürgen Habermas. While similar in many respects, both to arguments that stress the danger of technical elites and to those that emphasize the theme of autonomous technology, it suggests that such developments are basically epiphenomenal. If anybody doesn't know what epiphenomenal is, is um, something that uh, is produced but has kind of no causal efficacy, it can't do anything. Therefore, it's epiphenomenal. Horkmeyer stressed the extent to which the technological or instrumental rationality had involved the subordination of human reason to modern industry and how science had been transformed into a servant bourgeoisie society and a means of creating social values. Marcuse emphasized this latter point, claiming that what individuals such as Weber saw as rationalization in modern society was in fact a mode of political domination and repression that served certain class interests and was tied to a particular historical and social situation. Technical reason was itself an ideology which masked a system of control over society and legitimized political power in the imposition of surplus repression. Habermas considers the problem of the relation of technology and democracy or how technology or the scientifically rationalized control of objectified processes can be contained within a range, within the range of the consensus of acting and transacting citizens. Habermas believes that even though the proper means and relationship between technology and politics has been reversed, and the pol politician has become a mere agent of the scientific intelligentsia, the historical necessity of the technocratic model is an illusion which reflects pre-existing unreflected social interests and pre-scientific decisions. So that's obviously the Frankfurt School's Habermas's kind of theory, um, which is interesting. The assumption that technology cannot be controlled by democratic public will is as incorrect as the more optimistic notion that it is in fact under control. In contrast, to the technocratic model, Habermas advances what he terms pragmatic model, which requires that social decision-making involve mediation by public as a political institution in which communication regards social interests and, and values takes place. Um, I would argue this is part of the whole problem too that you see in the 18th, 19th, 20th century political philosophers is again, a rejection of the created order and natures and with it the transcendent ground of that order and being i.e. God, right? So it's a Luciferian rebellion. It's a Promethean hatred of the gods and a recreated order in which it's no longer theocentrically oriented and there's no theocentric concerns. Everything is humanist in, in the worst sense of the you know anthropocentric man created in man's image according to man's ideals the measure of all things and that results in everything being reductive to politics a denial of the transcend uh, the transcendent realm and metaphysics 
and everything is reduced to politics is what I would argue has led us exactly to this situation. So what does Habermas say? Reduce everything to politics, social decision making involved the mediation, right? So that would be my critique there. There's always a relation between politics and science through the medium of public opinion, he thinks, and the historical self-understanding of a social group. Um, sounds like Elena. Huh? Even though it does not always rise to consciousness, sounds Hegelian, doesn't it? Sounds Hegelian, doesn't it? But this mediation can only be effective where public communication about practical issues between citizens is institutionalized and free from repression. I guess the difference between Hegel is that Hegel thought this process was inevitable, whereas Marx and the neo Marxists um, protected themselves from that era of that kind of. Uh, it's dependent on on man, so it's not inevitable. Okay, let's go on. Even though it does not always rise to consciousness, as I said, but this mediation can only be effective, according to Habermas, where public communication about practical issues between citizens is institutionalized and free from repression. Oh, don't forget, always put it in the dialectics, uh, press or oppressed, proletariat, bourgeoisie, um, religious versus science, right? If all else fails. A scientized society could constitute itself as a rational one only to the extent that science and technology are mediated with the conduct of life through the minds of its citizens. In modern industrial society, however, the depolitization of the mass of the population is a component of a system of domination that tends to exclude practical questions from public discussion. Habermas claims that scientific and technological knowledge and the corresponding structures in society are manifestations of work or purpose, purposive rational action, purposive, which is a fundamental element of human condition and social organization that arises from a universal cognitive interest in technical control over objectified processes, he says. However, such knowledge is complemented and should be governed by a political or public community, which is the expression of a basic practical cognitive interest. Um, this is reminiscent to Marx to me, where Marx says that uh, throw away the abstract, right? Um, this is kind of this rejection of certain metaphysical quest questions and makes man the pragmatic man the practical man, um, so we can see some of, they're not, you know, they're the neo-Marxists, they're the Franklin schools, they're different, but you can see some of these themes in there. In communication and development of cons consensual norms in which, which in turn is devoted to furthering the fundamental human interest in social emancipation. Habermas argues that modern science developed in a context where the focus was on technical control and science and technology had become interdependent by the late 19th century. This mode of control is now being utilized in contemporary society where there is an increase in state intervention to compensate for contradictions in advanced capitalism and to secure the stability of the system. Political power is legitimized by the claim that the state is merely involved in the solution of technical problems. That's actually interesting. In this situation, there is no discussion of social ends in a public forum, no public decision making. Science and technology are productive forces in a system. And since the system depends on economic growth, social interest coincides with the maintenance of the system. The technocratic model thus becomes the basis of an ideology which governs social self-understanding and the perception of society and which, if unchecked, leads in the direction of autonomous technology and the absorption of all society into the purposive rational subsystems. Habermas's recommendation is to work for the creation of a democratic public realm and to begin politicizing the masses through the media and the education system. Um, right. Here he believes is where the legitimate consciousness of technocratic society must be undermined. So some interesting remarks by Habermas there. Um, also 
some of my critiques of. But again, we can use the various authors to see where they speak true and where they don't. Okay, let's thank Norman Ernesto. Thank you. Donates ten dollars. I'm becoming a catechumen on Saturday. Glory to God. Wonderful. Um, Thank you for your work. He says, God is good. God is good. Um, and as we approach this Holy Pascha um, and the Holy Resurrection, we truly see and remember, and not only remember, but experience now how actually great the glorious resurrection truly is. Let's see. How are you guys doing in here? 59 watching. Good job. Sweet. Who we all have in here? JJ Mike Ale. Leanna Jethro. Hey Jethro. Tamara, what's up? Good to see you, Tamara. Lena Weber, Patrick Ronan, Alex, Mick Ale. Evan Schultz. Well, hello, Evan. Vlada. White Top. Jeff Blanco, always a pleasure to see you. Ben Lezer. Who else do we have in here? Jay Dyer's not in. He's doing a, a stream on somebody else's channel, so I apologize. Rendizi, Orthodox Albanian. God bless you. Ortho Bros. Prism. Hello. Beach House, Tennessee. Shanty GT. Good. Good to see you guys. My neighbor's spying on me. Should I open the window so they can hear my lecture? Habermas's cosmic explanation of technocracy are as difficult to relate to actual political circumstances as Lul's is what Gunn includes. So he's doing his critique now. But the concern is remarkably consistent with more modest analyses that focus on the devolution, de-evolution, of decision-making power to technical specialists. The fear in every case revolves around the loss of political or public control. But even though all three dimensions of technocratic image are predicated upon some ideal typification of the political, rarely is its substance or the rationale for its autonomy and dominance articulated in any detail. Yeah, we've seen that. The decline of politics in the public realm is a principal theme of modern political theorists such as Honor Arendt, and to some extent the critique of technocracy must be understood as a species of that literature. Yet what is characterized as the subversion of political is often merely a nostalgia for an image that has little significant concrete expression. Too often the criticism of technocracy, both in developed and underdeveloped countries, in the name of democracy and representative government rings hollow. Even in instances where neither the institutions nor social structures that would support them exist, the political image and the technocratic image are rarefied and discussed as if they were historical entities. The ideal political which is invoked or tacitly assumed in most critiques of technocracy can be found, among other places, in Aristotle's actual notion of the polity. Also in various 17th and 18th century theories of republican government, in Rousseau's description, actually, of the social contract and general will, in Hegel's vision of the state, in Marx's concept of socialist society, in various versions of classical democratic theory, and in the work of contemporary political philosophers such as Arendt and Abermas. It is an image of a generalized community which stands above particular social and economic institutions, and associations and directs them toward a public interest which is something more than a mere compromise be between competing private interests. It implies the primary allegiance of each citizen to the public community and to a dedication to the notion that associations and private interests are instrumental to the creation and preservation of public interests. It is in this public realm that the higher faculties of the human being, the capacity for rational discourse and interaction with others, in the pursuit of the common good and ethical life are expressed. And by the way, this is where I'm going to form my like my critique. And Gunnell kind of goes into this, but you, this will never happen in a pluralistic society. And I've argued 
that. We have to have a common ethos, right? A common religion, a common culture, um, and we don't share that. So you, especially on fundamentals, right? Like you can't have multiculturalism and have uh, it succeed as, as being a restraint on technocracy because cultures, people have to compromise, right? You're, you're always going to be divided, right? And it, it can be, that's going to be done through the democratic um, and representative forms of our republic and which it further weakens uh, the public. So I'm not kidding, we don't be, you know, it's true that you really do kind of need a, a neo-Orthodox Byzantium, an emperor, right? To consolidate that power, to be a restraint against such things as this and other evils, um, to have a common religion, a common ethos, common values. Um, that should be somebody's campaign. Stop celebrating diversity. Unify. Doesn't God say that? I wish you were one. <laughs> even Christ says, even as I and the Father are one. There ain't no diversity. We know we're talking about the uh, you know essential di diversity. Like obviously, not everybody's not to dress and look exactly like. But on the essentials, unity. Truly representative government must provide a medium through which citizens can effectively participate rather than merely ratifying the actions of elites. If there were in fact such public community in such realm of public action, then the notion of public interest would not be merely fiction or euphemism, but a confirmation of the value by a community that engages in collective deliberation to determine social goals and to make social choices. This would be politically a rational society in which all things that are matters of common concern and potentially matters of collective decision, including development and implementation of technology. So yes, you know, again, going through this, one doesn't have to be in neither am I anti-technology, but again, it's how that's, who has, what was the, who and what has the power and how does it have the power? Um, is the socio-political structure good, right? Is the ends that, what are, what's keeping, what's a restraint on uh, a libido dominandi, right? And um, rather than questions of ends, everything becomes a question of means because I can produce it, I can make more, um, and everything becomes an inventory and everything becomes exploited. Right. So technology, the, the, the ancient of technology. Participation in this decision-making process would be seen as an end in itself and not a function of the pursuit of private interest, which with some ideal in mind, the notion of preventing an ascendancy of technocracy makes sense. But this ideal assumes the existence of a public community of which government is the agent, maybe an uh, empire, an emperor. Czar, king. Often this is simply not the case. There is a growing literature of assessment and control of technology as well as alternative technology, intermediate technology, and participatory technology. Without a distinct, legitimized, and authoritative public realm and public community, however, it is difficult to see how pertinent policies could be articulated and implemented, as we just said. I don't know how you do it without a God-fearing, ordained emperor. It's not one thing to encourage reflective criticism of technology and form choices among available technologies, but to the extent that this would involve more than a critique by academics and intellectuals, it implies the existence of a public realm that is more than a form for competing private interests. Apart from the vagueness about the character of rational political society as an alternative to technocracy, all three kinds of analysis that have been considered here were informed by strands of the traditional technocratic image which to some extent function a priori as a priori constructs. There is often an imposition of these schemata 
on widely diverse historical and political circumstances, even though their general ex explanatory validity is questionable. What is sought in each case is a comprehensive causal answer in the most primitive sense of the concept, an answer based on agency. This is most apparent in the elite theory, but it's also true in Ellul's anthropomorphic technique and Habermas's notion of an underlying class interest. These theories may all reflect certain important aspects of the relationship between politics and technology, but they also project a somewhat frozen image that may miss the specific source of the difficulties in a particular historical case. The concluding section examines the American political experience and offers us, just one second, two basic arguments. First, the founders of the American Republic believed that it was possible to fashion an institutional surrogate for classical political ideal, for the classical political ideal. The vision of the founders was, in fact, a profound expression of the technocratic faith. A belief that an applied science of politics could devise and implement a rational political society. Second, although the system of pluralistic constitutionalist policy politics created by the founders is often treated as a solution, this is my point, I agree with Gunnell, even though it's pre uh, presented as a solution to the problem of technocracy, under modern conditions, many of the features associated with the political pathology may actually be inherent in that type of system. Well said, Gunnell, I agree. Okay, the last section for Daniel Borston has called the United States the Republic of Technology and has argued that this character has found its fullest expression in the development beginning with the founders of the technology of politics. This ideal has been persistent theme in American political and social science. Addressing um, the American Political Science Association a few years ago, Austin Rene suggested that we can find, quote, in the creation of American polities, history's first great political experiment in massive effort at political engineering and the application of empirically derived general principles of individual and institutional behavior to fashion institutions intended to solve practical political problems, end quote. That's, that's amazing. Constitution making in light of the divine science of politics, guys, was the aim of the founders. And Rene quite correctly it's either Rene or Rene, suggests that, quote, it also launched a faith in political and social engineering. Those are those themes I'm telling you about that are, you know, the seeds are found in the 17th, 18th century political philosophers. So the political and social engineering that had persisted ever since as one of the main elements in American political culture and one of the prime force American political behavior. The idea that, quote, if we can figure out and establish the right institutions, the right policies are bound to follow. And the main article, faith, and it is this faith to which most in our profession still cling, he quotes. Many of the individuals who contributed to the creation of the Constitution believed that the technological potential of American society promised a means of producing political virtue. Benjamin Rush saw in new technology and industrial manufacturing a means of escaping the corruption and the corrupting influence of the old world. Techne, Cox argued that an industrial, sorry, uh, Tench Cox had argued that an industrial society would restore to the citizen the social virtues that sustained Republican government and promised an educational system that would convert men into Republican machines. Hilarious. <laughs> the, la the mouths on these men. <laughs> Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Above all, this attitude regarded the symbiotic relationship between technology and politics was exemplified in the idea of the constitutional system as an institutional substitute for Republican polity. 
Between the Revolution and the Constitutional Convention, it became more and more evident that there was not a homogeneous, politically virtuous people of the sort that had been assumed necessary for the establishment of a Republican government. That indeed, the new nation was, quote, remote. What was that quote? Quote, remote from the happy empire of perfect wisdom and perfect virtue, end quote. Although the men who promulgated the Constitution were committed to a form of popular government and determined to place elaborate fetters on government institutions, they were primarily concerned with establishing a central government power, transcending the authority of lesser government units, i.e. state rights, incapable of checking excessive democratic tendencies. But there was no ideologically or physically identifiable political community which the government would represent. The founders set out to create not simply a national government, but an institutional arrangement that would function as a surrogate for classical Republican politics and the ideal political community it presupposed. The Enlightenment faith in science and progress was to be extended into the realm of political techne. That's really well put, actually. The philosophy of the Federalists, this is what we're talking about, attempted to rationalize and make a principal defense of the new constitution and also to overcome the remnants of classical Republican theory in the Anti-Federalists. Um, it might be useful for everybody to read the, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists papers there. That's actually really good. So that's to squash the Anti-Federalist thought, especially the notion that popular government rests on a homogenous political society and must be limited to a territory and population small enough to sustain democratic participation. And by the way, that idea of democratic participation working um, is found in Rousseau's idea. So he supported that only insofar as really small community. So you see this kind of Rousseauian idea come in the kind of anti-federalists, right, that they could only work um, in a homogenous, so throw out multiculturalism, um, political society that was limited to a small territory. Know your neighbor um, was this kind of idea. Is the only way that that could actually work. Now, obviously, the Federalists are going to destroy that. Madison and Hamilton address the problem of creating political order in a society threatened by factions and convulsions, lacking definable organic structure and too extensive to sustain political community. The people were no longer conceived as an intelligible body with a collective will, but as a mass of individuals coalescing to factions around a diversity of relatively fluid interests over which government was erected in which the totality of government represented. By the way, reading this in the history of the United States, I mean, isn't not a recipe for disaster. In traditional Republican theory and ideology, the constitutional structure had been viewed as a medium for participation and governance by natural and distinct elements of society. Well, gone are those days, destroy the natural and distinct elements of society. Now, however, it was seen as a substitute for participation and as an instrument for filtering elites and policies. The separation of powers, for example, was no longer an institution conceived as having any particular social counterpart. It was merely an internal mechanism for balancing and checking overlapping governmental structures and functions. The problem was one of making government control the governed. Amen. That's well put. And then by so contriving the interior structures of government, making it control itself somehow. What Madison claimed was the most novel about the new system was that unlike earlier republics which had been characteristically unstable, it created a form of government that was wholly popular and yet simultaneously affected a total exclusion of the people. This is a quote. Total exclusion of the people in their collective capacity. Here was a popular form of government in the sense that it was understood as based on a consent of the people and as a delegation from the people as individuals. And also in the sense that the Constitution was ratified 
by the people who had elected the officials to the government. Still, the legislative branch was not considered a vehicle for participation of the people through virtual representation, but merely is one mode of government and in fact is an impetus vortex to be balanced and contained by other branches of government is well divided within itself. The constitutional structure was viewed as a mechanism for aggregating and compromising various social interests in such a manner as to produce a functional equivalent of political community and collective political deliberation. It was not democratic but it was supposed to achieve democratic values. Hooray! In attempting to meet arguments based on classical Republican ideals, Madison sought to demonstrate that the system would achieve those ideals functionally and the application of the language of ideals to the realities of the pluralistic constitutionalist politics has confounded American political discourse and political consciousness ever since. The system was designed to, quote, break and control the violence of faction, end quote, which was rooted in human nature and expressed in the different, here you kind of have a Hobbesian Leviathan, don't you? Expressed in the different and unequal faculties of acquiring property. In such a way, and you hear you have the, not just Hobbes, but the social contract theorists. In such a way that no faction could gain a majority and no minority faction could gain control over government and oppress other interests. The system was predicated upon the assumptions that society was composed of diverse interests seeking their own advantage and that it was vain to hope. This is exactly the contractualist here talking um, in the founding. Quote, that enlightened statement, that enlightened statesman will be able to adjust the clashing interests and render them all subservient to the public good, end quote. To the founders, American society appeared as the epitome of the disease, characteristically associated with the downfall of popular government. That is, faction born of private passion, the absence of political virtue or a com uh, commitment to public community, and a social universe of ambitious, vindictive, and rapturous individuals what was required was an institutional means of achieving public interest, quote, the opposite of rival interests, end quote, that tore society apart might, if properly channeled by constitutional alchemy. Doesn't that sound great? Hey, kids, you like it? <laughs> you like constitutional alchemy? <sighs> okay, that is a good phrase. I just lost my place here. Constitutional alchemy. Where did I see it? If properly channeled by constitutional alchemy based on the scientific of politics, the science of politics, see, you legitimize it, but it's throwing the word science on there. Bind it together and correct the defect of better motives in citizens and politicians. The problem was to create a system in which the excellence of Republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. Madison's famous answer, enumerating the Federalist, was to make the infection of fraction acute, organize interests through institutional devices for limiting and reconcile them, produce equilibrium within and between government and society, and thereby utilize a normal procedural majoritism, create an artificial public realm, is his idea. The Constitution was conceived, to borrow Mandeville's phrase, as a mechanism for transforming private vice into public benefit. Well, I could sell some of that. I'll buy that. I'll buy the machine for transforming private vice into public benefit. Or what you got here is a catalytic converter for transforming licentiousness into common good. Or you can run that in a, a four-door Chevy. It don't matter. As long as you got that Cadillac converter, convert that licensed and common good, transform private vice and public good and benefit, it all good. And if you buy now, I'll even throw in a free copy of that constitution. 
In that scheme, the people were sovereign in the sense that they provided the opinion or consensus which authorized the Constitution and legitimized the power of constitutional elites on which all government ultimately rested. But the people, the people was an analytic, analytical fiction apart from the mass of particular wills expressed in group interests that were brought to bear on government and animated the governmental process. In the American constitutional polity, it is actually the constitutional system as a set of institutions that is functionally sovereign. And you thought the people were sovereign. Ha, ha, ha. And it was designed, i.e. that constitutional system, is a substitute for a rational political community that stands above and directs your private and social interests and government to a public purpose. Government and public become identical, right? The people versus um, John Smith, right? It's like the people. Do you see that's interesting, huh? How that's linked. In this case, the public interest is also an analytical fiction and means no more than either the common denominator of private interests that are fed into the system or the product that emerges. The American Constitution was a response to a particular kind of political situation, and though in many respects it was a viable solution, Gunnell says, it created problems. And those problems which it in turn was neither equipped nor designed to solve. I were, were thinking about the technocracy. In a relatively non-complex society in which the ethic of classical liberalism prevailed and where only a few issues need to be matters of common concern and public decision and about which there was likely to be wide agreement. See this common ethos I'm talking about? The constitutional substitute for communal public realm was possible. But as the complexity of society grew, as technology advanced, more issues became objects of common concern because they touched society as a whole, growing economic and social interdependence, and the emergence of positive government and the interventionist liberalism began to render the constitutional vision inadequate in the United States, as well as in most Western pluralist constitutionalist polities. There is, and has been for some time, a crisis in public authority and legitimacy which has been contained only by resort to numerous ad hoc legal fictions and ameliorative policies and institutional appendages. The Madisonian theory assumed that in certain fundamental respects, the constitutional structure must be separate from society. Measures had to be taken to prevent interesting too strongly the public passions in government or in government would be captured by particular social interests. And these interests were in turn to be protected from its oppression by government. But the constitutional structure is procedural and non-substantive, Gunnell says. It's true. Its values must either come from or be legitim legitimized by groups in the private or social sector, right? So as Orthodox, we argue this too, right? How does the empire, I mean, do you, how do you get a Byzantine empire, a czar, a, a God-ordained king? Um, it can't be forced on. This is legitimized and arises organically from the group, the ethos, those who are practicing Orthodox Christians, both in the private and social sector. So what Madison termed as the constitutional equilibrium operates in response to those interests and in public policy must always be manufactured from compromises between those interests, right? So this is, this is the problem with multiculturalism. You're going to have to compromise your values and your religion, right? And the government's going to enforce that. Various groups put pressure on government to introduce policies, let's say abortion, that are in favor or stop policies that are not. Government in turn seeks the support of groups in order to gain authority and legitimacy. Yep. The need to win the support of a coalition of interests in order to act, the demand that government justly represent all legitimate interests, and the increasing difficulty of meeting such demands and needs in the areas of broad social concern, these lead to well-organized problems of pluralistic politics. 
the breakdown on many fronts of the distinction between public and private or government society, the loss of public authority in many spheres, the need for government to sell or unsell its policies in order to gain legitimacy, the semi-constitutional status of entrenched interest groups and the delegation of sovereignty to quasi-official bodies, the decline of party system, the obstacles to new interests and groups gaining interest into pol political processes, the difficulty of implementing policy with respect to any concern not associated with particular groups, the sidestepping of formal constitutional procedures in favor of government by bargaining between bureaucrats and interest group elites, and the paradox of specific interest organizations being formed a lobby for issues conceived to be in the public interest. Government continues to expand, but there is no increase in rational public control. The problem is simply that public ref that policy reflectively of general public will is not possible. The government cannot govern a group of interests, cannot govern in such areas such as energy, which are a matter of common concern, but about which a congruence of group interest is unlikely in a system in which the government is an arena for an umpire over an institutional balancing of private interest with no distinct political community for which it acts as an agent. The breakdown of separation, separate government and the fusion of public and private is inevitable. Wow. Government becomes little more than an extension of pluralist politics as interest groups seek power through government and government seeks authority through interest groups. In this situation, it will often appear that technical elites are ruling. In fact, it's going to provide the whale for that. Pluralistic politics creates a crisis in political legitimacy and a vacuum in political authority into which elites are going to naturally gravitate by virtue of economic and social power that they represent. The Gil Bates, the Klaus Schwab's and the organizations and foundations, the Rockefeller's Institute, etc. Um, because the expertise and knowledge that they, they possess, in particular, um, not only that, the money, and the, and the particular issues that happen to face the government that they will naturally have to depend upon. That is, the government depend upon the technocratic elites. In the paralysis and deadlock that often accompany the competition of pluralistic bargaining within government and between government and society, elites wield power. Power wins the day. Money talks, the expertise fills the vacuum. Many of the elites are simply pluralist elites, or those represent blah, blah, blah. But in many cases, the vacuum of political authority is filled by the authority inherent in scientific rationality. Okay, so that's what we see going on. Um, we're almost done. Let's see if you guys, let me see how you guys are doing right here. Let me, nice, Jay, welcome to the stream. Don't forget, there is the Super Chats and the Streamlabs there. Um, and then we'll go over any theories. Who else do we have in here? Let's see if we've got any Super Chats that were added since I last. Give a shout out. Is human milk vegan? <laughs> what a great name. Donates $15. Any news? on the book you and Dyer were working on. Um, I'm still working on some chapters. Uh, I know that Jay um, has the priority of the project with Dr. Hears. And now my priority project is actually working with 20 of the top Orthodox scholars um, and even doctors and bioethicists on the unfortunate response of the Orthodox Church concerning the fear that it's taken um, towards the CUFID. And so we're gonna speak with kind of one voice on that. It's really important, uh, we've divided into sections about science, politics, and theology. So I'm really looking forward to that. There's a silver line in the skies, guys. So that for me, that book we're hoping to have published um, by the end of the year with uh, so forwards and afterwards by prominent um, bishops and metropolitans. So super excited about that. So I'm gonna put that on the priority list. I know Jay's got his priority list, but we're still working on it. Don't worry, it'll come out and it'll be good. All right, let's see.
let's just finish up and then I'll take up any questions that you guys have. It is the particular character of the political system and the nature of the political processes that in part account for the emergence of technocracy is basically what's been argued by Gunnell, I would agree. And the nature of the political process in, um, and it, in all three basic dimensions as he's outlined. In brief, constitutionalism and political pluralism are what have given rise to the technocratic phenomenon, despite the fact that they're often viewed as the solution, as we pointed out, they're actually part of the problem. Um, to recognize the deficiencies and limitations of the pluralistic constitutional politics does not require prescriptive utopian, right? This is what all these guys do, right? Let's emitize the Ascaton, um, let's bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth, create heaven without God, right? And you're kind of John Lennon, imagine. Imagine there's no heaven, imagine there's no hell below us, only the brotherhood of man, right? No possessions. Sounds like garbage, dude. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, John Lennon. Sounds like every other goofus theory <laughs> and emitizing the, the eschaton created a utopian you know, Luciferian rebellion and Promethean hatred of, of God. See how that works. And by the way, you lose. <laughs> we, we actually, you know, the end of the story, you lose, right? So don't try it. Okay. So we recognize those deficiency and limitations of a pluralistic society of, the, of our democratic republic and constitutional politics. Um, no, we're not going to resort to utopianism and Gnostic speculative theories of amortizing the eschaton. He suggests to resurrect the classical idea, the classical political ideal. Well, yeah, the, the Greeks had a good, they understood their order and nature, right? Society was not egalitarian. Society, uh, sorry, uh, reality itself and nature was hierarchical. Man understood his place within nature. Nature had real essences and natures. And all of that was grounded in the transcendent God of which served the highest purpose in which everything was oriented. If that's the solution, amen, John Gunnell. And to have a critical analysis as an illustrative contrast model, okay? So I think that's what I'm doing. A vision that stands, um, let's see, it goes on. The difficulty is answering the concrete problems. It always is. It may well be nothing more than an institutional surrogate for authentic public realm as possible and that pluralistic politics represent the future of society in the West as well as the third. Don't be so pessimistic. Things might get better. <laughs> but it's necessary to recognize the manner in which many of the problems associated with technocracy can emerge in such political systems and to recognize the limitations inherent in political technology as far as solving those problems. Such recognition will at least make possible to confront the issue of technocracy in a realistic and historical relevant manner. All right, that's good. I think it was a great um, paper. Also, I'm gonna be digging into William Atkins, Technocracy in the American Dream, uh, 1977. Uh, so Henry Elsner Jr.'s The Technocrats, Profits and Automation from 1967 is to kind of, as I write some more papers on this and relate it to our contemporary crisis especially as we as Orthodox. Um, should you align yourself with the B system of the technocrats and trust the science and the experts? Or do you put your faith in the city of God, the saints, and the holy pious elders? What say you? Okay, let's see. Here is, don't forget... You super chat right there. Um, does anybody have any questions? Let me just check super chats once more.
I'm not going like two and a half hours. I just gotta finish up my preparing my lecture for tomorrow. I'm almost done on ethics. What are we doing tomorrow in ethics class, guys? You might ask. Ethical pluralism and absolute moral rules. Actually, it's an interesting chapter. I really do appreciate it. Nobody else want to donate money? Well, if you don't want to donate money, can you, do you have any questions? Thank you for your comment on a great stream. Let's start with uh, bringing rice. I don't see how America can become czarist or business since America was founded in part by not exactly. I don't see how that's possible either. I don't have hope for that. Unless, again, the people acquire a spirit of orthodoxy so much that, you know, and sometimes in times of persecution, the church thrives, as we've seen in history. Then the system would be, you know, overthrown by the, the right of the sovereignty of the people of what they wanted in an organic way, um, the czar and a, and a Byzantine empire comes from the faith and orthodox faith of the people. It's not a top-down planning kind of thing. Um, Divine right to rule America since it would lie with the tribal councils of Native Americans. Why would it rather lie with the tribal councils of Native Americans? Anyways, I don't get that. But um, Prism says I think Christians in America can be convinced to endorse monarchy in the future. Yeah, I used to be a libertarian, and I was convinced simply just by being. Um, okay, the Reese report. In orthodoxy, deacons are the lowest order of the priesthood. That's why. That's why I'm... And you don't have that in Roman Catholicism, or pro certainly not in Protestantism. So, I'm not a priest. I'm in the priesthood. So in that sense, I'm a priest, but I'm not a presbyter. I'm in the lowest order of what's called the major clergy. However, because that Roman Catholics don't have them, Protestants, um, my proper title is either father or father deacon is to represent that, if that makes sense. But it's in orthodoxy, the priesthood is deacon, presbyter, and bishop. And they're all priests, even though the second order is actually called priests. But I'm the lowest ranking order. I'm the deacon. And with each of those uh, orders, um, you're able to do certain things. I can't administer the sacraments, or I can't consecrate, I can't hear confessions, stuff like that. Um, but I'm in the priesthood, if that makes sense. Uh, other questions? Yeah, grassroots. Okay, I'll go up. Converter. <laughs> yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe. Wow, already 96 likes. We have 60 watching. Um, thank you, Lala says, great stream. Um, thank you, Jay, for bringing Jacob Johnson here. Sup, bro. Um, got ortho bro here. Thank you, Brandon Rice, for the respect. Uh, let's see the who yeah thank you sitting bull that was be another I didn't think about that um, Jay's great at this stuff too by the way um, you know he's been doing you know the geopolitics and stuff like that so he's a great reference to get references on the global elite books remember he does a whole series on that so shout out to Jay and the Jay Dyer um, let's see, CJ, 
Yes, CJ, it's Christian and Bishop. That's again why. Um, you guys, the power, a lot of power lies in the laity. Unite. Um, be smart about it. Be res you can be respectful. Um, but, you know, it's important that, you know, we Orthodox academics unite to, to speak with a voice too. You know what? You might be able to just ignore me and just be like, oh, he's a crazy deacon. He's a philosopher. What does he know? Um, but when we all come together, when we got the very best of us speaking in one voice, it's going to be much harder to brush us off and call us conspiracy theorists and stuff like that. Yeah, Klaus Schwab does look like a legitimate Dr. Evil. Anything else before we depart? Um, okay, here I, I rebooted. So, do you think that once people stop worshiping science, they will have a spiritual awakening? Will it be one obstacle to remove? You know, who was it? G.K. Chesterton said that, you know, kind of speaking about the atheist, when man stops believing in God, it's not that he stops believing that, but rather that he'll believe in anything. So, I think it's more of a symptom, a sign of the spiritual disease, that the rebellion and the rejection of God, um, man still has to be religious. Yeah, get that up. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I ain't leaving until I get 100 likes. So what does he do, right? He either erects, he usually erects himself, right? Remember what Nietzsche says, right? Um, we've killed God, you know, how are we going to make ourselves worthy of, so is this not too great of a deed for us? What festivals of atonement must we, must we not become gods ourselves just to be made worthy of this event, as he says in the gay science? Um, so man makes himself God. You know, you may make science God. You may believe in aliens, right? <clears throat> it's hilarious that you have atheists saying that God doesn't exist. How improbable is that? I believe in aliens, and that and it's pan sperma. That's how we got here. Um, so G.K. Chesterton's right in that sense that not that they stop. Believe they'll believe in anything once you get rid of that. So, congratulate! Yeah, 100 likes, sweet. <laughs> I'm partying now with my zero calories Xavier Stodia. <laughs> oh, yeah, bro. Oh, no sugar, black cherry. These are delicious, by the way. Sugar is from the devil. Once you let that into your mouth, <laughs> you will become demonic. Sugar is the devil. Um, what if the revival is led by the Latins? A lot of new light is Roman Catholic. Um, I seriously doubt that's going to happen, given the state of the <laughs> their church. But again... We Orthodox believe that we're the f we possess the fullness of truth. So that allows us, and that's not a philosophical system or anything like that. It's God who revealed himself to us. And what we received in the apostolic deposit of faith, which allows us then to say that like, well, this philosopher, this religion, that's true there, that's wrong there. So, um... Obviously, the Latins, the Roman Catholics, can do good things. Um, they do fight against abortion pretty well and stuff like that. So, uh, 
as far as any intellectuals fighting against kind of technocracy and the coof and stuff like this and scientism, I'm not particularly aware, but um, I'd be interested to find out. Um, yeah, Father Peter Hears has talked about this a bit. A bit. Yeah. Remember, guys, don't despair. Like, evil doesn't have the power to create. Because, you know, we're going over a lot of these articles. We finished uh, Carlo Lancelotti's, uh, Lancelotti's article in our political philosophy class. So basically, we did, we just finished, we finished this book. We finished this book. We did Carlo Lancelotti, Augusto uh, Del Noche on the new totalitarianism. Now we're basically tomorrow. I'm going to give a lecture on what we just went over now. So now we're going to technocracy and we'll do Arthur Kessler. We might do some Brzezinski and then end with uh, Bertrand Russell's two articles. Um, to kind of give us a like an idea of what technocracy. If I had more time, I'd even I'd originally had uh, Klaus Schwab's COVID nineteen: The Great Reset is to it's still in the course files for the students to reference in writing their papers and to go further. Uh, <laughs> Brandon Rice, nice one. But I mean, all this stuff's all nonsense. What we really want to know. I mean, none of this stuff is relevant. What we really want to know is um, what a Gnostics um, Kabbalist theory of Cubans and ice cubes are. Um, inquiring minds want to know. Let's shout out to Marty. By the way, don't get upset. I'm just, it's just being funny. Nothing wrong with humor. Um, I think Marty got upset by that. Anyways, uh, yeah, that would have been nice to actually have the Klaus Schwab in there to see how that actually related. But, you know, as far as we've already gotten already, we're now getting kind of like the beginnings of the theories of technocracy in my social political philosophy class. I'm teaching um, here at Carroll College. You know, it's very easy for students to kind of get blackpilled and be like, oh, I didn't know it was this bad and stuff like that. And so I had to kind of remind the students that, look, evil doesn't have the power to create. Evil's destructive and it's self-destructive. You know, you see these evil regimes that were, you know, this Chileanism is supposed to usher in the new thousand year reigns and stuff like that, like crumble within... <laughs> Um, you're seeing it go on right now. All these woke policies, go woke, go broke. Like your company will go down. Like nobody want to hear this. Nobody got time. Nobody wants to watch the NFL anymore. Um, <laughs> taking the Nissan cue to the next Marty debate. That's hilarious. Um, so there's hope in that, that like evil ideologies, um, Non-orthodox, as you pointed out, uh, uh, the Reese report, um, do not triumph over the church. The gates of hell will not prevail. The bill gates of hell will not prevail over the church um, that these things eventually um, implode and destroy. Uh, however, um, it doesn't mean that we don't endure persecutions, must not be ready for them, must not anticipate the kind of steps of where these ideas are going to take. Uh, must, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually provide legitimate critiques and push back against that. But don't lose hope. We know how the story ends. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, amen. Hey, mom. Uh, okay, let's see. Let me check. You got your last chance to send in a super chat. In fact, I might actually be inspired. What would you guys think? 
since I've done all the work now, I actually put together for a cheaper, and I'll even throw in a Zevia soda. Now, I'm going to put together, since I've already gone through the material and I have all the notes and stuff like that, how about, you know, I offer the logic courses. I have seven two-hour courses with the free $90 PDF book with the PowerPoint size, my personal notes. What if I did something like that? Since I've already gone through all the work, like all the work's done, right? I have the, I just provide the lectures for you, but I have the notes, I have the PowerPoints written out. But if I had a course with even more lectures at a discounted rate, perhaps even half the price of ethics or the, and, and or, I'll have two classes I could put together. Um, 19, 20, 18, 19th, 20th century modern political thought. Offer that even cheaper than the logic. And the reason why is because there's a lot more evolved in the logic. It takes a, it's a lot harder to actually write and put together. But would you guys be interested in that? And I could throw a third one, maybe an introduction to philosophy. Um, I have a web page being designed where all the course material will be put up together. Also, all our web pages, right? Jay, uh, Michael Cisco, um, Day the Real Med, Orthodox Shahada. Um, I got to give my shout outs now. Who am I? Luke. Um, oh, Brother Augustine. I know I'm missing missing people here. I have a list of, and then it'll be like organized. Um, oh, Tristan. It'll be organized as far as like topics. So you can actually like source hit this, you'll get announcements and stuff like that. But we'll have one confederation of an orthodox defense against the anti kingdom. Energetic procession. Um, I'd love to, to have Perry on the. I would. I don't. I never mind linking his articles. I don't think he's interested in doing any videos though. Let's see. So would you? You guys? Yeah, you'd be interested in that. Yeah, the website's almost. My Godfather's working on it. I think it's about ready to go and be launched. Um, let me just pull it up so I have the names, the names and ages of each. Uh, da, 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 da. Everybody who's included, I hope I didn't leave Jay. I said Jay, that's right. All these homilies. Oh, let's look in here. Okay. I'm not going to spend the rest of the night trying to find this, but if what in the world? Anyways, if I forgot your name, who I'm supposed to include on there, forgive me. Um, I'll make my shout outs next time on, let's see. All right, guys, thank you so much. It was a, thank you for your donations again. Um, that'll really help. I'll try to provide more content. I'm almost done. I'm writing my finals now. So like, I'm almost going to be done, um, for the semester and I'll have uh, a lot more time to do, provide you materials and work. Thank you for all my Patreon subscribers. I appreciate your support. Um, you can also support me and I'll put the thing in my um, 
on the YouTube, excuse me, for, uh, you can also give to my PayPal, which is at uh, esormatapu.edu. Um, don't send to the other email. I'm locked to an Ireland account. I'll never get the money out. Um, okay, God bless you guys. May we have a blessed um, Holy Week going up, a blessed Thursday, Holy Thursday. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you who are able to go to liturgy, uh, uh, Holy Friday. And then finally, um, a great Holy Pascha, Holy Saturday, and then uh, the Pascha. So I also want to announce and welcome, um, we've reached over 6,000, just over 6,000 on uh, the Discord. And that's amazing. We're getting so many converts from all different faiths to Orthodoxy. We, I've counted at least today, we're always announcing more, at least 21 new newly illumined who have been received in the church this Lazarus Saturday united to Christ and his holy church and sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God bless you guys. Amen. I'm so happy and proud uh, that you made it in. We've received also a lot of uh, people just made catechumens as well. So the glory of God is working in the world. Um, and, you know, God grants you many years newly illumined. And I'm so happy that you made it home. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful evening. And I just have to stop my stream. God bless.